tell us our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your business. Hey, Diego, thank you so much for having me on. So I am the founder of Financial Asset Protection. It's a financial services firm located in Chicago, Illinois, but we pretty much service clients in all 50 states, uh, pretty much running a virtual remote financial services practice. And we specialize in one main focus or one main practice, and it is the infinite banking concept, also known as the bank on yourself strategy. And what the strategy involves is using dividend paying whole life insurance, but rather than for the life insurance part, mainly for the savings component or for the living benefits while people are alive. And we have a focus on real estate investors and business owners. So we show real estate investors and business owners how to grow safe and predictable wealth using whole life insurance and mainly for the cash benefits and, and growing wealth, regardless of market conditions. So take us through the, the subject a little, a little deeper, because I'm a life insurance agent as well. And I think it's important for at least our Portuguese uh, people to see exactly how would you present it? Let's say I was a customer. How are you, how are you going to uh, guide me through the process? Yeah, awesome question. So pretty much there's kind of two ways to do this. One way is to describe uh, life insurance in general. In the United States and in a lot of different places, there's typically three types of life insurance. One is term life insurance, uh, the other is whole life, and the third is universal. So term life insurance is pretty much like imagine renting a home. You would usually rent a home for a set period of time. And then once you're done renting, you would leave and you wouldn't have any equity or, or cash value with you. Same thing in term. You would get a term life insurance policy for like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You would pay a small amount to insure your life for a, for a set amount during that time period. And then once that time period is done, that's it. The policy kind of cancels. You have the option to renew, but there's no cash value. There's no equity. Whole life is like buying a home. You have the market value. You have cash value. It's, it's a more of a permanent form. It's a long-term form of insurance. Um, and you would build up the policy. You have a life insurance part. And then you also have cash value or equity that you could use in the policy that you could borrow against. And the universal is pretty much a combination of term and whole life. It has some flexibility. Uh, I'm not too big of a fan on universal life because it kind of, it's a little tricky in terms of the fees and how the fees accumulate over the years. But for the purposes of this conversation, we'll pretty much focus on whole life insurance. And we're pretty much using a, a life insurance policy that has equity, that has cash value that you could build up. And the reason why it's important for a lot of real estate investors and business owners to think about cash building up somewhere is because you everybody needs cash reserves sitting somewhere. But of course, we don't want our money sitting in a bank account or checking account, not earning any interest at all, because then the, you know, the bank is using your money and they're making interest off of it, but they're not getting, giving you anything in return. But at the same time, I don't think it's wise to invest every dollar back into a business because you need liquidity. You need that money back sometimes to be able to afford expenses or other investment opportunities. So you need liquidity. So I think this strategy using whole life insurance addresses both needs where your money is sitting somewhere that's earning compound interest. And it's also liquid at the same time. I, I agree. And regarding uh, touching bases with prospective clients, have you been finding that now people are more cash oriented because of the economical uncertainty right now? Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of people now are thinking about, you know, what, how do I have cash reserves for times like this? And I think, you know, during the, the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020, a lot of businesses who were able to stay in business were the ones who had cash reserves or either on the business side or their personal side, uh, as opposed to those who were consistently reinvesting all their money uh, and had kind of like, you know, quote unquote, their eggs in, in one basket. So I think that having the cash reserves is definitely important. And it's also kind of counterintuitive, right? Because why do we own businesses? Why do we invest in real estate investing? Why do we invest in real estate? It's for the cash. Thus, the cash should be the primary focus. It should be stored somewhere. It should grow somewhere. It should be accessible. Um, I think the cash focus comes before the business focus. I agree. Do you find that you need to constantly educate your customer base uh, until they actually understand that this is very beneficial to them? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a, a big curve because of a couple of reasons. One, um, when it comes to saving and growing money, instantly people think in the United States, at least instantly think the stock market. That's the way to do it. And I think there's pros and cons to it. Uh, but however, I think that the volatility of the stock market is it's unpredictable. Nobody knows when the next crash is going to happen. And I, I don't think that's a wise place to store your cash reserves in a place where with uncertainty. So it's kind of, it's, it's a curve to kind of 
get people to shift from that mindset of the stock market, traditional investments, conventional investments to more of dividend paying whole life insurance, because it's more of like, um, it's more of like an underground thing. You know, it's not something that's publicized, you know, to save money in a life insurance policy and then borrow from it and then use it. So there's definitely, and that's and a good thing too about technology and like social media and things nowadays is there's so much free content, you know, the podcasts like this, other podcasts, YouTube channels, um, books, a lot of books about this that you can go out and read about this. And we typically advise clients to, to learn that before we work with them, because it's going to be almost impossible for me to like pitch all of this and kind of convince the client to, to make a move without them doing their own research on their own time first. So you find that they are already pre-educated before you present them your, your idea or you think you need to, when you understand the need from them, then you need to guide them through all the process and say, listen, John, this is the best way for you to go about and do this because this, 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 and that. Yeah, definitely. Most of the, most of my clients, they listen to me on podcasts and they see me on different places. So they're, by the time we get on the phone, they're familiar that we're going to talk about life insurance. And then we do like a 60 to 90 minute financial analysis where we, we dive into their financial situation. We see where they're at, like cash flow, assets, retirement plans, uh, if they're currently real estate investors. And we kind of see from there which whole life policy and which funding amounts would be most appropriate for them. So pretty much they're already expecting all of this. And if they're not, if, for example, I'm, you know, in, in my building in the elevator and I'm talking to somebody, I would pretty much send them like a link to a podcast that I did or a YouTube video that I did to kind of introduce them into this whole world. Gotcha. And run us through a little bit regarding the numbers. So let's say I would be a, pr a prospective customer and mm -hmm. I would need, let's say, one million bucks on retirement in like in 25 years time. So run yeah. us through the process a bit regarding the product that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So, so pretty much if somebody is, let's say they're 40, 40 years old, they want to retire by the time they're 65, they want a million dollars in cash value by the time they're 65. Typically in that time period, 25 year time period, um, it's kind of safe to assume or project that for every dollar that they would save into the policy, they would see a return of probably three and a half times to four times that. So they would pretty much have to invest or save about, you know, 300 uh, 280 to $300,000 cost basis, meaning the cost of insurance. Sure. And then the rest of that would earn compound interest and dividends over the years to the point where they would have a million dollars by the time they're 65. And also too, is that back to the liquidity part, let's say, for example, you start a policy when you're 40 years old, a 25 year policy when you're 40 years old and you're saving into it like midpoint, you have a few hundred thousand dollars in the policy. And you need to use that for real estate investing or to for you to grow your business. You could borrow against the policy without interfering with the growth of the policy. So let's say you know take it a step further. Let's say you have two hundred thousand dollars in cash value. You needed to borrow a hundred thousand. You would borrow a hundred thousand dollars from the insurance company, leveraging your cash value, not deducting from the principal. And then when you do it that way, your cash keeps growing as if you've never touched it. This is why it's called infinite banking or bank on yourself. You're able to become your own source of financing instead of going to a bank and then paying them interest. You could use your policy and then recoup that interest you would have otherwise paid. Because think about it this way. Let's say you have a savings account at a bank. And let's say the savings account is earns 5% compound interest every year. And let's say you have $100,000 in the savings account and it's earning you 5% compound interest every year. And let's say you go to access $1,000 from this. You subtract $1,000 from this principal. You're actually taking out more than a thousand. You're taking out a thousand plus the loss of opportunity costs you could have earned had right. you have kept that money inside that account growing. So the logical thing to do would be to borrow against that cash reserves or that savings account at a lower interest rate. You're earning 5% interest. You borrow at 2% interest. This way you have a spread on your money. You're earning 3% on your money and still using it for real estate investing or for other businesses. So you make money on debt. And this is exactly what large corporations and large banks do. They have, you know, billions of dollars in cash reserves and whole life insurance. They earn, you know, five to six, sometimes 7% compound interest on this money. And then when they need to use it, instead of deducting from that principal, they borrow against it at lower interest rates from different sources, leveraging their cash value. And that way they use for payroll, they use for land expansion to market in different countries, et cetera. Gotcha. And regarding the premium, how much would be a premium for a policy like this? So let's say our 40 year old guy, like to a 25 year term policy with mm -hmm. all these components. 
Yeah. So if you pretty much, um, it's kind of hard to think about this because if you, it all depends on how much you need in cash value. So if you needed back to our example, a million dollars in cash value, um, you would pretty much have to save, um, I have to do a calculator, pretty much about 300,000 divided by uh, 25 years. That would pretty much be the the cost of it, around the cost of it. Because with whole life insurance, the fees are usually the highest in the first two years. And then eventually over the years, you end up, your dividends and compound interest end up outpacing what you're paying into the policy, which explains how you can have three times the amount of money in retirement. So, but there's gonna be a dip in the first two years. And then after that, you eventually recoup the cost of insurance. So it's something to consider too, is not something like whole life insurance is not something where you could put like, you know, in the first year, three times your money. It's, it doesn't work like that. It's a long-term strategy. Sometimes it could be for five years, seven years, 10 years, 20 years, or indefinitely. It could just keep going. I, I got to ask you, because obviously I understand this well, and you understand this well because we are in the field. But I, I, I think sometimes we are a little bit biased because we know these, this field so well that when, when we are going to go about and present this to someone else, they might not see it uh, in this particular way. Have you been finding some struggles when you're trying to present this type of product to people? Yeah, absolutely. People who have um, like pre-existing ideas and like a, a paradigm, a different paradigm where they believe like the way to do it is IRA, self-directed IRA, stock market, you know, the conventional financial advisors, you know, a lot of banks have financial advisory departments. So they, they believe that that's the right thing to do is because Think about it. They saw their families doing this. They, they learned about this in school. They learned about this from college professors. So to them, that, that's the right thing to do. And I don't, you know, it's, um, uh, there, there is right in it. You know, it's not 100% wrong. It's just, there's better ways to do it. I don't think the stock market and IRAs and 401ks is, is that's the only place where your money should go. And I also think that with whole life insurance, it's not an either or approach. It's not either I put money in a whole life policy or I invest it somewhere else. It's kind of a both and solution where I put money in the whole life policy and I invest in real estate and the stock market and other places, but you're in control of your cash reserves. And I think that's the point is that you want to bank on yourself. You want to rely on only yourself and have, have control over your own cash. I agree. If you be finding that it's useful for you to have uh, real estate partners and partners in areas they are in, in a way serving the same type of customer when you are going about and present this to someone because i find that let's say you partner with cpas or trust fund or trust fund lawyers or they might understand your product better and when they come about and meet a client and say this is the perfect guy for him or her yeah absolutely definitely that's part of my job you know and that's part of my marketing is to have uh centers of influence um, trust attorneys, business lawyers, uh, certified public accountants, other, I even have like other financial planners who do different types of financial solutions, you know, who would still like vouch for whole life insurance. If the client wants, if the client wants some of their money sitting in a whole life policy, and then some of it sitting with the financial advisor, that could also be a solution, but yeah, definitely. And they do help because there is a lot of legality involved. There's a lot of taxes involved. For example, in most U S states, the cash value in a whole life policy is protected from lawsuits, from bankruptcy, from creditors, and from other outside risks, as opposed to having your money sitting in a bank account or in a mutual fund or brokerage account. The money that sits in a whole life policy is protected. But obviously, I can't give, le I'm not an attorney, so I can't give legal advice to people. However, if I have a, an attorney who is a friend or a center of influence, I could have him or her explain that more from an attorney standpoint to the client. And also it, just because, you know, it's, it's in writing in the law for that particular state doesn't mean that it's going to apply to every person in that state, because there's other, you know, with lawyers, there's other like angles that they have to look at. Like, and, and that's where that's what they're for is to look at the specific situation of the client. So that's the attorney could pretty much do that. And the same thing on the tax side, like the growth of the whole life policy, the, the, as it's earning compound interest and dividends, that growth is growing tax deferred, meaning you don't have to claim the, the growth in there on your income taxes. And then when you take money out in most situations, it's just, you're taking money out tax-free because you've already paid taxes on that money going in. And under current tax law, that's how, ta that's how whole life policies are taxed. And then the life insurance part, the death benefit is also tax-free to, to your estate or to your family. You know, But at the same time, I have to be very cautious with this because I'm not an accountant. I'm not a tax professional. But I, a lot of a lot of centers of influence are tax professionals, so they could explain more about this in depth to the 
uh, client and their specific situation. I agree. I think partnering up with different types of skill set people, let's say a lawyer or an accountant, it's useful like doing co-joint, co-venture seminars because you are essentially uh, educating your partners and also future clients. And I think this is really valuable because sometimes people are biased because they are only seeing it from their perspective. And when they see it like both ways, it's super beneficial. I've seen that sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes people won't even, you know, um, they won't even believe you. But then when an accountant, everybody believes their accountant and lawyer, you know, <laughs> but when somebody else says something. Um, That's right. So yeah, just definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I've been doing that a, a lot lately. I've partnering up with with specialized uh, knowledge people so that they can instruct their clients better. And I find that I need to meet with them first. And then they tell me, listen, tell me all about your product. How does this work? Because if I come across some client, maybe I can explain this to him. And you're right, because I trust them before you because they know the lawyer first. Yeah, correct. I agree. And regarding, regarding the types of, uh, uh, how, how are you prospecting at this time? It's all virtual. How, how are you doing your, your uh, touching basis with clients now? Yeah, the vast majority of it is through podcasts like this. So far this year, I've done about, this is, I think, my 72nd podcast as a guest that I've done. So a lot of it comes from, from podcasts and like this. And of course, the, the, they're uploaded on YouTube and different places. So I do get from this. And I'm also part of a marketing organization. And they get leads and then they sell me those leads once a client is interested. And those leads are also, uh, people are familiar that we're going to eventually talk about whole life insurance. So that's pretty much my two biggest ways that I get leads right now is through podcasting. And then I buy the leads from a marketing, or marketing organization that I'm affiliated with. Yeah, because essentially I, I find it, it it's, it's a two-pronged a two process. You need to develop, develop yourself as a figure of authority. That's one. But on the other hand, you need speed and speed, you get it from leads. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a quality and a quantitative approach too. So you do need the, the message. You need to refine what you, who you are, what you do, how you can help people. And then you also need like a mass broadcasting like to that too, or a way to mass produce that. Gotcha. I got to ask, just uh, changing course a, a little bit. Uh, how, how did you get into this? Uh, like finance, it's like a passion from a toddler. How did you get into this? Yeah. Um, so I, I was doing my MBA, my master's degree, and about halfway through it, I started working with different insurance companies. Like I worked at Allstate Insurance and I worked, and then I, I merged into the healthcare field where I was working with a lot of retirees, uh, people who were like 64, 65 years old. And, and for, I was a Medicare consultant. And I would help them transition from their Medicare plan into their own uh, Medicare solution. And during that time, one of my clients asked me if I could help him with life insurance. And he said, uh, there's a life insurance that has cash value that builds up. And I had no idea what he was talking about. But I, uh, we had a good relationship. And I told him I would do more research for him. And I went to Amazon and I searched for books about life insurance. And I came across one. It's called The Bank on Yourself Revolution by Pamela Yellen. And the book, I read it and I kind of fell in love with the whole concept and, and how you could build up cash using a whole life policy. And the author even goes into detail about how it's even uh, wiser to do it that way than other places like the stock market or other the traditional funds. And then, and also about the liquidity part. And then I, I ended up getting my own bank on yourself type whole life policy or dividend paying whole life policy. And then there was also a section in the book that said, if you wanted to join our organization as a financial advisor, there's like an eight week rigorous pro training program. I went through that and then I became a bank on yourself professional. And then I also started reading different books, you know, becoming your own banker by Nelson Nash and, and other books about, uh, about this concept and pretty much founded financial asset protection. I still do Medicare business, but uh, mostly about 90% of my business now is financial planning using dividend paying whole life insurance. I agree. I think it's a good vehicle. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, the whole thing about like, uh, uh, going against whole life uh, insurance, I don't agree with it at all. I think it's way too much advertising against something that is actually pretty good. Yeah, definitely. And not all whole life insurance is the same. So everything that we're talking about here doesn't apply to every whole life policy. And there's some things to consider. Like number one, it has to be from a mutual insurance company, a mutually owned insurance company, not a stock owned insurance company. So a mutual insurance company, they give their dividends and profits back to the policy owners, to the customers. Whereas uh, a stock-owned insurance company, they give their dividends and profits back to the shareholders. 
So number one, it has to be a mutual insurance company. And then number two, the, pro the policy has to be properly structured, meaning that it cannot be just 100% whole life insurance only. There has to be um, a cash value rider, also called a paid up additions rider in the policy. And then there has to be kind of like a balance between every dollar you put in that goes to the whole life policy. And then a part of that goes to the paid up additions rider or the part of the policy that builds up the cash value. Typically it's like a 50, 50 split. So every dollar you put into the policy, half of it goes towards the life insurance and the other half goes towards the paid up additions rider. And the third function is very important to understand is something called in finance, non-direct recognition. This means that if you remember in our prior example, we talked about having you know $200,000 in cash value, you borrow $100,000 from the insurance company, you're not deducting from the principal, rather you're borrowing against the principal at a lower interest rate. And then this way you can have the growth. You could only do that if it's a non-direct recognition company. And that means that the insurance company will not recognize the fact that you have an outstanding loan when they're paying you dividends and interest on your money. So your money keeps growing even when you're using it. If it's a direct recognition company, then they will reduce the dividends and interest they'll pay you based on the fact that you have an outstanding loan. So it's key that it's number one, a mutually, mutually owned insurance company. Number two, there's a paid up additions rider and there's a balance, a healthy balance between the base premium and the paid up additions rider. And the third is that there's an, it's non-direct recognition. And there's about 1200 insurance companies in the United States. Out of those 1200, only four companies could do all of this. This is the one thing that I decided to go all in regarding life insurance. Cause I'll tell you a little bit regarding the Portuguese scene regarding insurance. Most agents, they're like general insurance people. It's like they sell it pretty much everything. And from the get-go, I never agree with that because I know from it just doesn't work. You need to specialize and become super focused because then people start seeing you and they talk pretty much like you are talking. They, you know what you're talking about, right? And it's important when you're trying to help people doing financial planning, helping seniors or whatever the type of customer that you have, so that you can actually understand, you understand the product and then you can actually help them move through some hurdles that they have. What, what are your thoughts regarding focused and unfocused people in our, in our field of expertise? Think about when you go to a doctor, is your doctor the same as your cardiologist, the same as your back doctor, right. foot doctor, dentist, is it all the same? No, there's specialties and there's even subspecialties. You know, there'll be a cardiologist that focuses on people over the age of 65 in a particular location. You know, there's dentists that only do dental surgery for, you know, teens or, you know, younger adults, you know, there's, there's subspecialties. And that's, that's, I think the key to marketing and being an expert is you need to specialize like super, super focused. Um, same thing with lawyers, you know, lawyers is bankruptcy, divorce, business, criminal defense. A lot of people who are wise and educated will not hire somebody who does everything for them because they know that it's too much, you know? So like, even when I wanna, if I wanna hire an accountant, there's even, you know, CPAs that focus on real estate investing in a particular area. And if, if you're a real estate investor and you need an accountant, that's the focus to go to. So the same thing here in this situation, uh, if somebody comes to you right now and wants car insurance or homeowner's insurance, I will, I'll refer them to somebody else. I don't want to waste my time going through that hassle and, and losing focus away from this subject, you know? So I think expertise and subspecialties are extremely important, especially in whole life insurance, because it's not something where you could just, you know, click quote, you know, and then just have a whole life policy, like a five minute or 10 minute meeting. It's something that requires, you know, multiple meetings and you do need a knowledge on whole life insurance. You need a knowledge on financial planning, you know, some tax, some legal knowledge and putting it all together and dealing with the centers of influence and, and, and dealing with the client's families and referrals. So it's definitely something to focus on for sure. Gotcha. And if people don't want to learn more about this type of product, can you, you already mentioned your, uh, that first book, but there are more books that you could refer to. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's uh, bank on yourself revolution by Pamela Yellen becoming your own banker by Nelson Nash. Those two are really good. And then also some other books I recommend just about like, you know, I'm, I'm a really big fan of mindset. There's a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. That book is also really good. It talks about the differences between a fixed mindset and growth mindset. And I and it's definitely, and the reason why I bring up mindset too is um, it's very important too with, with this whole, whole, life, whole life subject that there's a mindset shift between you know, thinking like a consumer or thinking like you know, a borrower versus thinking like a bank or a large corporation, you know, where, where we show clients how to pivot and, and use it. So I, I'm, I'm a really big fan of mindsets. 
I agree. I, I need to go back to finance a bit. Let's mm -hmm. say we are talking about a context, a context of let's say a merger and acquisition or like key person insurance. Where this type, where would this type of product fit in? Yeah. Okay. So let's say a key person. Okay. So this is pretty much the a company. What has an executive or an employee that is highly skilled and and they're they want to be able to retain this employee and and pretty much um, prevent them from going to the going to a competitor. What they could do is they could take out a key person policy, and and pretty much it could be either a term policy or whole life policy. If it's term, they would just pretty much um, ensure the life of the client or ensure the life of the employee. But if they could also apply this whole life strategy with it, so this way they can retain the employee, build up cash value, and they could even make a deal with the employee and say, if you stay with us for 10 years, we'll, we'll take this whole, whole life policy and then we'll turn it over to you. And it could be like, you know, at the end of 10 years, the whole life policy will have like $200,000 in cash value. And this way, the employee knows if they stay for 10 years, they'll keep their pay for 10 years, plus some of the raises and bonuses. And then at the end of all that, they'll get a huge bonus of 200,000 as an incentive to stay. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is like a buy-sell agreement. If there's two partners, they own a business and one of them passes away, the other one could be the beneficiary. And the reason why that's important is so that way, because sometimes if, if there's two people that own a business and then one of them passes away, then the family of that deceased um, partner will come in and, and run the business with the original partner. And then that might not have a good mix because the two partners were used to running the business together. So the partner who survives could use the death benefit insurance to buy out the other family's shares. This way the business can continue without any you know family disputes or family conflicts. That's called a buy-sell agreement. And then also too, is that what you could do is you, the, the whole life policy is an asset on a balance sheet to a business. So pretty much it could be the cash reserves. Let's say there's four partners in a business and they want to build the business so that way it does have cash reserves and all four partners own a whole life policy, one whole life policy that's owned by the business. The ownership of the policy would be congruent to the ownership of the business. So four, four people would essentially own 25% of the cash value of the whole life policy. And this way it gives them a concrete measurement of how much the business is worth. If the business has a million dollars in cash value, then whatever the business is worth, they could add the $1 million cash value on the value of the business, making it easier to gather more investors, to sell the business, to leverage the business, to borrow against it. It gives you a concrete like cash reserve or cash amount because it's very subjective sometimes when valuing a business. So the whole life policy could be like a concrete way to do that. So in other words, a lot of creative things you could do, especially on the business side and the corporate side with whole life insurance and other types of insurance. And it all comes down to the, you know, the financial analysis. You know, if we're talking to a business owner, we'll do a, a personal financial analysis on the person. And then if they have a business too, we'll do a, a like a, a business financial analysis where we dive in and we, and we see, and then we might even do two policies, one policy that's personal, one that's business or, you know, either or. Yeah. And regarding a life insurance uh, policy right, for a group, do you do those types of policies with this type of product? Yeah, that's so the group whole, the group insurance is kind of like a different subject. You, it's still applicable. It's still possible. I, I don't do any group insurance, but let's say, for example, you could do it. You could do like if you own, you know, a company with 25 employees and you want to give them, you know, a benefit to stay with you. You could do a whole life policy with cash value for all 25 employees. And then this way they could even control the cash value in it um, and, and it would pretty much be a benefit. So, yeah, you could you could apply this in a group setting for sure. Yeah, and you can also throw in a couple of riders that are complementary, but it's also super beneficial when they have these these types of policies, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's yeah, there's different riders like um, uh, let's see what what rider is chronic illness rider. If they're diagnosed with a chronic illness, they could take out a cash value advance on it. If um, there's a lot a guaranteed insurability rider, that's more for like children. But there's yeah, definitely there's a lot of riders that you could add on. Yeah, income protection and and so on. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And people, if they want to get a hold of you, what's your, what's your best best way to go about and do that? So they can go to our, our website. It's finassetprotection.com. It's F-I-N assetprotection.com. And there's a link. You can schedule a free appointment. Uh, all our appointments are done virtually, either over the phone or over Zoom, whatever is easier for you. And yeah, it's all free consultations. You can go to Finn Asset Protection and book an appointment by schedule now. Thank you for joining us. We'll speak soon.
Diego, thank you so much for having me on.